Well, good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Calvary. We are in the middle of a series called Family Blueprints, and last week we talked about who godly people marry, and it was a really easy answer. Uh, They marry godly people, but somehow I still managed to preach 50 minutes on the subject. Wow. We'll see if that changes today, because today we begin on marriage. Marriage, and what does it mean? What does it mean when two become one flesh? We're gonna talk about the deeper understanding of that, and then we're gonna get into the practical ways of living that out next week. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis 2. We have to go back to the beginning again to make sure we understand God's original design for marriage. Uh, we, as I said uh, already, who do we marry? We learned last week. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about this uh, before you get into marriage, and then all of us who are already married, I believe we can learn and be, get a refresher from today's message. So if you are single today, take notes, right? And uh, married couples, uh, well, we should also take notes too to remind ourselves what this marriage is really all about. Now in Genesis 2, we already know that God placed Adam in the garden and he was supposed to take care of everything. And the word of God actually says in verse 20 that there was no suitable helper found for Adam. We pick up in verse 21 and it says this, so the Lord God calls the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God, that would be the first surgery, I guess, too. Just realize that. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. And then here's our key verse today. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one or one flesh. Adam definitely needed companionship, but he really also just needed help because of the duties that God had given him to take care of creation, but he also was challenged to be fruitful and multiply, and this is why God had to create a perfect helper for Adam to fulfill the work of ruling over creation and multiplying. And when Adam encounters his newly created wife given to him by God, the Hebrew says that he is elated with joy. He's like, at last, ah, Think about this for a second. Everything else is animals. He's like, I can identify with this person. I can communicate and talk with this person, with this creature. This also may be a reason why men like ribs because he, uh, he got the, he lost the rib, but he got it. It came back even better. The rib became a woman, which is amazing, you know, it's, so, uh, it's so cheesy, but just making sure you're, you're, still, you're here with me already, you know? <laughs> okay. Pack, uh, packed in this, in this one verse, though, is something extremely important, a sacred definition of marriage. And by the way, um, ladies, I know some of you like ribs, too, so no, yeah, I just want to be fair, right? Uh, sacred definition. Uh, this union between man and woman is part of the creation order, okay? So this was established in the beginning of time, all right? And uh, Christopher Ashe, in an article he wrote for a biblical view of marriage, he says that the marriage is given by God as an unchangeable foundation to human life. This definition of marriage is unchangeable. This is an unchangeable foundation to human life. So when you read that it says here, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother, you see, we see two genders here, and is joined to his wife, and then the two become one. All of those things matter to God that we honor that way. Simple as that. When the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus on a question about divorce and marriage, he answered by pointing back to his father's definition in Genesis 2. 
when the Apostle Paul was explaining to the church of Ephesus how to live in marriage, he also points back to Genesis 2. Why? Because Jesus and Paul know that the true definition of marriage is found from God. So they don't need a new argument for what marriage is. They have the one that's already established and works. And so they both point back to Genesis chapter two. And so I wanna give you just a working definition that I wrote. Marriage is a sacred union designed by God to join man and woman together as one flesh for the glory of God, to make God known, in other words. Our obligation as humans is to carefully respect and steward God's original design, the original purpose and commitment to marriage. So we respect this definition of marriage since the creator himself defined marriage for his purposes and for our benefit. We respect the purpose of marriage by fulfilling its goal, to live in unity with one another, to be fruitful and multiply, and to build the kingdom of God for people to see the glory of God on earth. That's the purpose of marriage. We respect the commitment of marriage by honoring the inseparable union of two, becoming one, and letting nothing separate us. And lastly, as we respect this sacred union of marriage, we are blessed with intimate companionship. Marriage is a blessing because you receive intimate personal companionship, the gift of children, the generational blessings and provisions of family, and having a family that's effective kingdom builders for God. What a blessing that is to have, amen? Amen. Marriage is like no other relationship or union in creation. There is none like it. God's definition says the two become one flesh. So what does that actually mean? To become one flesh, number one, means to leave your father and your mother. I wanna read something to you and I'll, I'll try to explain it. It says the significance of the language leave is that marriage involves a new pledge to a spouse in which former familial commitments are superseded. In other words, okay, your formal commitments to your parents are no longer uh, priority. Now, your priority is a commitment to your spouse. Marriage requires a new priority by the marital partners where obligations to one spouse supplant a person's parental loyalties. Okay, so this can kind of cause some tension in families, but the reality is when your son or daughter gets married, they no longer um, should be told what to do by you as a parent. Okay, I'll preach, yeah, (laughs) I heard. Now, before the wedding day, There's quite a bit of drama trying to get that ceremony going, okay? Because the future mother-in-laws, you know, can get into, you know, how things should be and yeah, yeah. They're not married yet, so yeah, I'm gonna, you know. But overall, when it comes down to it, should, now, should we always respect and honor our father and mother? Absolutely, okay? But when it comes down to it, the new husband and wife now have to develop a brand new authority unit and learn to lead together and trust each other and follow each other in that new journey. Mom and dad, you had your time. No, I'm just joking, I'm just joking. We do, trust me, when my, my son and daughter get married, I'll be right there to do this, to be available for counsel but I cannot tell my son's wife or my daughter's husband what to do, okay? They have to submit to one another in reverence to the Lord, okay? And learn how to do this. But they should seek counsel from their parents because we've done it before, amen? Yeah, no, amen, no, okay, all right. (laughs) To become uh, one flesh, oh, let me, I, okay, I got in trouble in the first service for this one. All right, Um, does it mean that you have to literally leave your house in order for it to be official? Okay, all right, now hear me out carefully, okay. Um, 
So in, the, in this historical time of this scripture, households lived together even after marriage. They traveled together, they made a town, you know, in the different parts of the region. And so technically, the husband actually didn't necessarily leave the household. They may have made their own home or, you know, they added an addition to the backyard. And I know some parents are mad that I'm saying this right now, but that's, okay. Should we try to find our own place to live? Absolutely. That way we can build a unit together. But what the point of the scripture is trying to say is that you don't have to physically leave your house to be officially married, okay? You have the vows, you have the ceremony, and you have the consummation of the marriage that make you official. However, ladies and gentlemen, sons and daughters, begin to build your own life, amen? And um, so, but back then, they were building civilization so they stayed together, and a lot of times the wife would actually leave her family to join the, the family of the man, or other times in other ways. So just wanted to put that in there culturally at that time, and things have changed today. To become one flesh is to unite, cleave, or cling to one another. I would try to keep this as PG as possible. So parents, be ready for later on this afternoon for any education needed. One flesh involves the unity of the whole person. Together, one purpose to live together for God, physical, that is sexual unification, and your whole life. This is a new life together where two people now become one, a God-designed balanced life. They counterbalance, though, each other's strengths and weaknesses. And yes, sexually, the two become one flesh, and that is exemplified by having a child from two different people having one child with both of their DNAs in them. Demonstrating physically one flesh. One flesh entails a lifelong, exclusive clinging of one man to one woman, in one life fully shared, you share each other's life. Marriage puts a barrier around a husband and his wife. And you ready for this? So like there's this barrier around you as one, but it also destroys all barriers between those two. There's no secrets, in other words, between the two. There's no privacy of something that no one else knows. No barriers, no, no thing that the devil could use to bring conflict between the two. Instead, you are united as one. Everyone follow me on that? That's the way God intended it to be, and that's what's happening when we become one. Uh, becoming one is becoming a great team together, complementing each other, helping one another. And we're gonna talk more about that next week. But there's no doubt that to become one does require a physical, sexual experience with each other. And we're gonna learn more about that in a moment, why that's important. So finally, uh, we also see that in scripture that a marriage publicly declares that they're one. Okay, that they have a ceremony together and family and friends come together to celebrate, but God witnesses your marriage. The one who created marriage is your greatest witness of the marriage. That's why when I do wedding ceremonies, I make sure everyone knows in the audience that we are standing here before all of them, before God and each other to be a witness upon this marriage. And it needs to honor God's definition of marriage at the same time, out of respect for his definition. Okay, now we also wear rings to publicly declare that we are one with someone else. So someone belongs to me and, and, and they belong, and I belong to them. I belong to my wife, she belongs to me. And so we are one, okay? And the world should know that we are one together. All right, pretty simple, right? What are the practical implications though and applications in two becoming one flesh? Okay, now, I did not expect to preach this, God gave this to me this week, and I need to make sure I clarify, and I, and I bring it out to you. I need to teach this, okay? If we're talking about that when you become one flesh, you must practice that physically together as a couple, all right? That practice of physically coming together is in the context of marriage only. 
You understand? Okay, so number one, becoming one flesh in marriage implies we ought to preserve our gift of sexual intimacy for our future spouse. In other words, you preserve your sexual intimacy to give to your spouse and you already start respecting him or her before you get married by preserving yourself and being a virgin. That's literally what the scripture is pointing to is the sacredness of sex and the sacredness of saving yourself for that one flesh union. Our, our scripture is pointing to that. It was always intended to be shared and experienced within the covenant of marriage. All right, now let's go to 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20. If you could turn to your Bibles, if you have it, so I can... Um, so I can give you a scriptural support for that as well and how important this is to God. It's not gonna be on your screen. First Corinthians 6, 15. And let me encourage you with this. If, um, so I waited till I was married to have sex with my wife. All right, I, I, we got married, was it 22? 22 years old? I think I was 22. So I waited till I was married and I, what I was doing was I was thinking about my spouse before I ever met her. And I was thinking, I want to preserve and save my most personal connection that I can give someone to the person I'm gonna marry for the rest of my life. But I also believe that when we have sex, we become one. Okay, that was my conviction because it's scripture. All right? Now, if you have fallen in that way or slipped up in that way, I wanna encourage you with this, that God forgives, praise the Lord. Okay? And what God would want you to do now from this point forward, if you're in a relationship or not, is to no longer practice sexual immorality outside of marriage, but wait until you're married to reclaim, so to say, or redeem that for your future spouse. When God sees that, he honors that and will bless you for that. And it's important that you go into a relationship that way, okay? So just so you know, there is another chance. Praise the Lord, right? Okay, cool, all right. So let's read 1 Corinthians 6. Why is this so important to God? Verse 15, don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say that two are united into one. There you go, the same language. So having casual sex with someone is actually practicing what you're supposed to do in marriage. But here's the other, here's where it goes further in. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him too. So if you're a Christian and you're practicing this outside of marriage, you are trying to bring in Jesus into this inappropriate action. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple or a vessel or a housing of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and, has, and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. It's a little quiet and icy in here now. It's true though, isn't it? You see, what I learned from scripture growing up is that it's not just me by myself, God's with me and Jesus lives inside of me. And that Jesus bought my salvation and has spared my life and, so I, I, and he lives in me through the Holy Spirit and I should respect all things. And no matter where I am, what I'm doing, I need, I need to remember that Jesus is with me. And what I do with my body, with my mind, with my heart, with my hands, whatever it may be, my feet, my actions, they need to honor God because he is with me. Okay, and I'm bringing Jesus wherever I am. That's what Paul is saying here, is to remember you're not alone and you belong to God first before you belong to some person in a relationship, especially us as believers, okay? It's a high expectation, but it's worthy because Jesus paid a high price for us, amen? amen. So let me get into this a little bit. Why is it so important that we save ourselves for marriage, save this gift of intimacy, well, before bonding physically and sexually in marriage, we can actually bond with someone when we're engaged in a whole different way. 
We can bond around the shared worship of God. You know, you can actually connect deeper if you worship together at church together and if you spend time reading the word and praying. What about serving together? You can practice bonding and being in relationship, practice being married by serving together. We bond through our passions in life, vocations, recreation, and leisure. We bond relationally through fellowship in shared moments and experiences. We bond emotionally through joy, laughter, and sorrow. We can do all those things and be safe and still in the will of God before we're married. Bonding without sexual intimacy helps us enter marriage soberly on the commitment of a shared bond around God. All right, let me, let me explain this by going further in. The danger of premarital sex is that intimacy causes us to have an emotional attachment that can cloud our judgment or discernment or hinder our ability to detach from someone that we find out we're not compatible with and we're not equally yoked with. So when, when couples practice this before marriage, now they have a hard time detaching themselves emotionally from that person only to find out a few months later they're not even compatible, they're not equally yoked, and now they have a hard time and now their hearts are broken and they, they, they struggle to separate when they're not even equally yoked and it's not healthy. The relationship isn't healthy. What happens is what we should be doing is practicing celibacy remain, uh, keep that gift of, of sexual intimacy, remain or refrain from it, sorry, so that we can bond on other levels and then share that to honor God in marriage. That is what God intends us to do. Now, guess what happens when we do share that moment? We have children. What do you know? Okay, okay. The danger of doing this outside of marriage is we don't have a secure home for that child where a mother and father are there, right? Whereas, now here's the thing though, we can get married and we can have a child the way God wants us to, but at the same time, there could be unfortunately a divorce or a tear in that relationship as well and now the child doesn't have the two parents in the home either. So we as married couples need to also watch ourselves too, amen? I'm trying to save us from a lot of pain and hurt because we're talking about family blueprints and I'm trying to save a lot of kids from a lot of pain and hurt too when I say these things. We really need to be careful about entering into any relationship, not even just marriage, and be careful what we're doing because it brings me to my next point. We're, we're, we're relating or dating or pursuing someone who has a soul, who bears the image of God. So number two, becoming one flesh in marriage means we unite with someone who also bears the image of God. We need to take this seriously. A marriage involves the hearts and souls of two people who carry the image of God. They have both been fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Gentlemen, the, ladies that you're, the lady that you're interested in, the lady that you're pursuing, she has been fearfully and wonderfully made by God. She bears and car carries the image of God. God's fingerprints are on her life. Be very careful how you treat her. Ladies, it's the same thing, isn't it? Be very careful how you treat the other person, how you handle that person that God sent his son Jesus to die for. The world around us has watered down these relationships, made them so casual that it's eclipsed the value and beauty and the sacredness of a godly marriage. So before you enter into this marriage, make sure you understand, what am I agreeing to? What am I vowing to do? Making a decision to step into a lifelong commitment must be seriously considered. You're not just dating for fun. We're talking about another soul is behind those eyes and that face. I'm, I am not digressing from that point because it's so important to me. Do not play with people's hearts. Men, don't be played. Ladies, don't be played. Don't use 
anything that you shouldn't be using to get what you want. Respect the person that you're looking at. They belong to God before they belong to you. Number three, this scripture on being one flesh uh, means you will be responsible to love, serve, and care for one another, not just yourself. There's a lot of responsibility in marriage, isn't there, married couples? Paul expresses this oneness, this care of others in Ephesians 5, 28 through 29, which we'll unpack more next week. But he says this, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. There's that oneness that how the man treats or how the husband treats his wife, they're so united as one that he needs to realize if he hurts her, he's actually hurting himself. But there's the beauty of if you bless her, you're gonna be blessed too. That if you love and serve and care for her, you are going to experience the same thing. And this also implies that we are supposed to do this for each other, that we're both supposed to serve, care, and love one another and fulfill each other's needs so you're both served, you're both fulfilled. So when one person doesn't do that, someone's hurting, but really both of you are hurting. That's, that's what it means to be one flesh. If a spouse isn't fulfilling their duties or their calling and their purpose, you are hurting your marriage. But when every spouse, both spouses, fulfill their duties, the marriage is joyful. It's thriving, it's beautiful. And I know we can testify to that in this room today. But there's an important point I wanna make today with this. If unity and oneness is this important, then that means selfishness is the, one of the greatest enemies against marriage. Follow me on this. Follow me on this, okay? Okay, if we're supposed to live in this union, if one person starts to do whatever he or she wants, that's selfishness, that can hurt the marriage. When we are self-seeking whatever we want and we do whatever we want because it's gonna make us happy, that's gonna hurt your spouse and it's ultimately gonna hurt you too. It's gonna hurt your marriage. There is no room for selfish ambition in marriage. When you say, I do to someone, you're saying, I'm willing to give my life for that person. I'm willing to serve them sacrificially. I'm willing to give up what I need and want to serve them instead. As painful as it may be sometimes, as hard as it can be, that's what we are called to do. It shouldn't be painful. It shouldn't be hard if we're both doing our part though, amen? amen. But church, I just had to say, okay, this is a burden of mine right now. Selfishness is a sin. Sin is selfish. And if we're always trying to do whatever we want and get what we want, that means we're not serving our spouse we're always trying to take something from our spouse. And here's the problem. Selfishness can lead us to look outside of our marriage too. That brings me to my last point. Becoming one flesh in marriage requires a commitment to nurture and protect the union. Becoming one flesh in marriage requires a commitment to nurture and protect the union. When Jesus was, was being trapped and he knew what they were doing, on divorce and marriage, Jesus says this in Mark 10, nine, therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. Let no one separate. We nurture the union by fulfilling each other in every way and we guard and protect the union by forsaking all other persons or decisions that would threaten to separate our union. When I do marriage ceremonies, I remind them that they're vowing to choose this person until the day they die, okay? And that when you choose that person, you're forsaking all other persons, all other people, because you're devoted to that one. Marriage is no joke, isn't it? It's a serious commitment, and you're protecting the union 
by not being pulled away by someone else or letting your selfish desires and ambition, okay, drag you and look, make you look somewhere else. But again, we as spouses must fulfill each other so that we won't look anywhere else either. It all works together, okay? It all works in tandem with each other. I'm gonna have the worship team come up and we're gonna spend time just to worship God and to respond today to this message and to consider, okay, if you're, if, if you're single and you're on the search, maybe you're a teenager, you're learning all these things. Teens, I wanna encourage you with this, okay? Um, right now, think about your spouse and pray for them. Pray for that person, okay? Live now in such a way that you're preserving yourself for your future spouse. I prayed for my wife before I ever met her. Amen. Think about now the choices you're making. The decisions you're making now do matter in relationships, all right? They really do. I think we can all testify that too in this room as well who've been there and done that. So I'm gonna close with this. Marriage should be entered and handled with incredible care, shouldn't it? Marriage is a promise, a covenant between a man and a woman before God as our greatest witness. Marriage is a call to be faithful to love and serve one another, forsaking all others until death do you part. Vows, those vows on wedding days, they are verbal affirmations. And marriage license are law binding records. But our everyday faithful actions of love confirm and prove our covenantal fidelity to our spouse. What am I saying there? Your vows, they lead to a, I sign a document on the wedding day with witnesses, okay? They made their vows, they exchange rings, and then they have this document they fill out and we fill out together and we sign. But guess what? That doesn't make you married. You have to start living that all out too, don't you? There has to be a demonstration of love and confirming your love for them by loving and serving and caring and being committed to your spouse. Let's stand together. Go beyond the words. Go beyond the paperwork. Show love to your spouse. Man, God is good. Marriage is such a gift. It's such a blessing to have. And we haven't always had perfect marriages in our lives. We know that. There's counseling for those reasons. There's mentoring, marriage mentoring. There's a lot of stuff that is offered to help marriages, including here. But this was an amazing gift from God to build his kingdom on earth. It's a sacred commitment. And so all of those who are searching, I just wanna encourage you to remember this on your search and to look for someone who has a similar conviction in heart. For us who are married today, may we be reminded of our duties and our call, this high call to love and serve one another to protect the union that God has established. But today, maybe you just need prayer because things have been hard. Things have been difficult. Maybe you need to stand the gap for another couple. Maybe you need to pray about that for them. Maybe you wanna pray about your future spouse starting today. We're gonna to have our prayer team, altar team come up here and be ready to pray with you if you want. During this song, let's give God this song as a prayer that we will let him build our lives and that his love will lead us to love those around us, amen? Let me pray. God, minister to us through this song, minister to us through this moment of worship. Help us to reflect on this message today. How can we be better husbands and wives? How can we be better in our search for the one? How can we honor other people by not crossing lines with them and honoring their future spouse? 
God, how can we change today? Lord, help us. And God, I pray, Lord, if there's any marriages on the rocks here, Lord, that are struggling, God, I pray, Lord, that there would be this humility between the two. Lord, that they would know the true enemy is the devil. They would understand that they're wrestling with, those, with their sinful nature. And God, that they would come together and deny themselves and come together to serve and love one another. God, I pray that it wouldn't be a focus to win the argument or to win whatever they're, they're trying to push through, whatever position they have. Instead, God, they'd be humble to change themselves. And God, we need your love and your humility, your, your power to do these things. So God, we look to you to fix our marriage. God, we come to you and ask for your help. God, we ask for divine breakthroughs. As Dorothy uh, prayed earlier, God, I pray you'd break down the walls, Lord. Break down these barriers. There should be no barriers between any couple, Lord, that is united in one flesh. God, I pray you would break those down. God, I pray against the enemy right now, demonic influences and in marriages. Lord, this false uh, fantasy of what life could be without the spouse. God, I pray you would destroy that wrong thinking. Lord, eliminate that from people's hearts and minds. Pull them back, Lord, to what you call them to be in their marriage. Lord, protect our marriages. Protect our, all of those who are single, God, our young people, Lord. God, I pray that we be reminded of this sacred gift of marriage and everything that it entails. God, we worship you. We ask you to build our lives on your love and in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Yep.